Okay. We're good to get started? Yeah, whenever y'all are ready. Awesome. All right, guys. So welcome this afternoon uh, to our West Virginia virtual NURSA conference here. Uh, not quite what we all had in mind, but uh, we're making do. Uh, my name is Tina Mascaro. I am from Fairmont State University. I am the director of intramurals and club sports. I've been at the institution for 20 three, 26 years. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of an, an old soul when it comes to intramurals and recreation and club sports. Uh, I'm here with Maxwell. I'll let him go ahead and introduce himself. I am Max Miller from Swarthmore College. Thank you to West Virginia for uh, letting your neighboring states join in for this um, and even uh, co-facilitate our uh, sports programming roundtable. Um, so I added in a question through the chat, just a poll for everyone. Do you oversee uh, intramural sports, club sports, or both? Just looking to get a sense for uh, the audience we have out there um, when we're talking about our various um, topics. Um, yeah, so we're, we're glad to be here with everybody and glad that you took some time out of your day um, to be with us and hopefully we'll use this time to be pretty productive. All right, let me, some overview and guidelines that uh, just want to put up there as we go through uh, today's roundtable. Uh, roundtables are a little bit different, so you will have the opportunity to speak, uh, and we hope that there'll be lots of conversations, uh, lots of good information that we can share with one another, uh, but we'll also use the chat box feature. So you can put some questions there, and you know Max will be monitoring that. Um, we do have some suggested topics, but that by no means means that that's all that we can talk about or you know, we can go in a complete different direction. Um, so be respectful of everyone's concerns and opinions. Uh, it is a no judgment zone. You know, we're here to share information and we are going to try to keep this to how it relates to club sports and intramurals and other sport programming that you might be doing in your rec center. There's other round tables for aquatics, for fitness and all of that kind of stuff. So we are going to focus on uh, intramurals and, and club sports as we go here. Um, so these are some suggested topics. We're gonna start right off with this first one uh, to kind of get the conversation uh, going. I know in uh, Microsoft Teams, we have a raise hand feature and I don't see it here. So, um, I don't wanna say it's gonna be first come first serve, but we wanna start talking about this. And again, we want you all to jump in and give your opinions and, and so we can share our information. So if we just find that you have unmuted yourself and started speaking um, and someone else is already speaking, just kind of mute yourself and, and just kind of wait your turn and we'll go from there. So our first question here, what types of programming are you currently, well, you know what? Instead of that first question, I'm gonna ask this. How many of you are actually doing programming right now? You actually have students on campus or is everybody done either for until the fall semester comes back up? So I think that, you know, thinking of that, this question in that manner, some of you may not, like myself, I'm only a 10 month employee. Fairmont State does not offer intramurals or club sports during the summer months because we just don't have enough students on campus to do that. So when, when I'm gonna be talking about my programming, it's gonna be more so the stuff that I've done in the spring or I'm going to do in the fall. So you can kind of think of it that way. So going back to this question then, what types of programming are you currently offering or will offer and how that's gonna change if we do not get full use of our gyms or our fields back um, and then also, what are you currently doing that you might still continue to do when we return to campus? So Tina, I'll just uh, start off to get a little bit of the conversation going. Um, currently, I don't over, uh, I don't, there's no intramural or club sport programming during the summer. Um, 
but in the fall, depending on, so if we're back on campus, but aren't able to have um, your typical sports, so our seven on seven soccer, six on six volleyball, um, I'm thinking about doing uh, soccer tennis on our tennis courts. So I'm um, having that as one, uh, two on two, each individual sort of sectioned in their uh, half of the tennis court um, and then using a soccer ball with your feet or to do a header um, to play tennis in that type um, or doing badminton, um, different ways to keep people active, um, but while staying in line with what are, at least now what the current um, guidelines are um, and trying to minimize person to person contact um, and keep a distance. Thank you. Who else? What else are, are some of you going to be doing out there? Oh, it's a round table. We can't have a quiet group out there. Matt Lobaugh from Slippery Rock. Um, a couple things we were thinking about is like a punt pass and kick, um, which could be individualized and you can actually set times for it. Um, you can do horse as long as they have two separate balls so they kind of do their social distancing. Um, we were thinking of actually trying to do softball. Since you, our fields are pretty big, you can actually keep people away from each other. Um, and they're just working on to see if we're going to have officials or not. Yeah, I definitely think softball is a um, softball, kickball, um, good alternatives. Just seeing maybe you want to uh, possibly reduce the numbers, um, make it maybe three individuals in the infield, five in the outfield, four in the outfield, something like that. Um, I mean, right now we're in a in a, a world of flux, so um, and all ideas are good ideas for sure. Another one would be pickleball. I know it's huge up in PA. I don't know how it is down in West. Oh Virginia. yeah. Matt, this is Jonathan from Marshall. I had a quick question, I guess, to follow up on that. Uh, what was the decision behind playing horse and making them have two different balls versus playing softball where you potentially have eight, nine uh, players per team using the same bat? So a total probably 19 or 20 players potentially using the same bat, but not two people using the same basketball. No real decision has come into it. Right now, we're just brainstorming ideas until we get our mitigation exactly what they want. Um, if needed, if we had to go to that depth, we were trying to do it since it's in the facility. We have more than enough basketballs, have your own. Um, if needed, they could use the same one. We would just make sure we wipe it down each time or make sure we have hand sanitizer on case so they don't touch their face and they would just wash their hands probably too many times. Um, there was really no thought process into it other than we have enough basketballs. Might as well have your own. So softball was determined just uh, for the ability to space players out, I'm guessing? So softball and kickball, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I think with, with softball and wiffle ball and those types of things, you can very quickly wipe down a bat if that's going to make management happy or make everybody feel safer. You can very quickly do that. You know, sometimes horse moves so fast, like you said, it, it's probably better, quicker. The kids can just grab their own ball and, and do that. And then you clean those two off at the end. Yeah, because we were actually thinking the same thing as softball, uh, maybe potentially adding more equipment and maybe another staff member. So each batter or each inning, we could clean the equipment, put the other equipment in, and then rotate the equipment out uh, sort of on a uh, inning by inning basis or a batter by batter basis, depending on what equipment it is. Yeah. I'm a cool idea that could – Sorry, Sorry Mac. Um, a cool idea to sort of have that um, wiffle ball, softball, baseball feel is to do a home run derby type of a competition um, where there isn't activity after the ball is hit. Um, it's more of just you have maybe an official in the outfield uh, saying if the ball went the correct distance um, or even with wiffle ball, um, if they get it past a certain distance and it's a single, a double, a triple, a home run, um, and then wiping down and sanitizing the equipment between batters. Um, and if you're going to do a softball home run derby, maybe just using um, a batting tee. Um, so the, it's consistent, one, it's consistent with the ball coming in. And then you also don't have to worry about um, anything more of uh, wiping down the equipment uh, with the ball. Just some, some thoughts for, for folks. We're thinking of using, we do outdoor adventures quite a bit. 
and maybe having like a trail set up for our mountain bikes that would be timed so that way really you can have them go the same day just in different intervals or kind of pick a day throughout the week that we can go out there with them and pretty much time the trail and so you can do it the fastest or vice versa um, that's really just got started within the last eight hours of talking about it so i don't have much information on it right now but it's just another thought process Matt, i wonder with that if you're able to use strava um or something to time people where you don't need to have a staff member from at a location, the individual, I mean, obviously it's all honesty um, and self-reporting. So if they click start when they um, start their ride and then stop it at the end of the trail to, to get timing. Um, but also if you're trying to get um, employment opportunities for students, that is an awesome opportunity. That's the biggest one, Max, was student employment was kind of big for us to go through. Cause if we have to eliminate officials altogether in some sports, I was trying to find other ways to find them employment that they'll be far away from everyone, but they can still do a job. So one thing that I'm going to have to do with my programming, because right now it's more about large numbers being in the same spot. I mean, yes, we have to worry about cleaning, but so my volleyball is now 2v2. I did add more badminton. I added more pickleball because you can do all those as single I can separate the courts, clean equipment after those people are done, and then you know have have a new opponent. Um, with our uh, instead of softball, we were just going to do wiffle ball inside, and we made that four on four. Basketball went to one v one, just one game, a fifteen minute game. Um, you know, no running clock, just one timeout. So for me, it was more so reducing the number of people that were going to be there at one time so that we can, again, have everything clean before they come. And when they're, when that group is done, then, you know, re-clean and be ready to do it again. So everything that I had done before, I tried to just, okay, can we do volleyball two on two? You know, can you, obviously badminton you can and pickleball you can. Dodgeball, um, we made, we're going to try three on three instead of six v six. You know, so just trying to still offer the same things that you did, but reduce the numbers and have specified time. So like if I can take, if it's volleyball 2v2 and I have two courts, you know, those people will get 30 minutes. And then the next group comes in after we have, you know, five minutes to wipe down the balls and, and get ready for the next set. So I'm trying desperately, I'm trying very hard to keep my programming very similar, but to, to meet these CDC guidelines and stuff about large crowds and numbers, just reduce everything. And I'm hoping that's going to work. <laughs> and, uh, question for basketball and stuff. I know at our university, there it seems as if they're going to go away from like contact in-person programming. So whether it's 1v1 or 3v3, basketball is pretty much a full contact sport between boxing out, defense, Correct other spit the sweat um is that going to be allowed at your university at this point if i were to go back today no it would not be allowed um the guidelines are constantly changing and since i won't be back you know we won't start in murals again until august we'll have to wait and see i put it in there uh you know our pcs have my programming and then i'm assuming they're going to look at it and say okay yes you can do badminton but no you can't do 1v1 basketball so I planned as if the world was going to be semi-normal and they'll have to just come back and tell us because again, you know, if you, if you take the guidelines now that fitness centers are open, you know, you have to wear masks, you have to do that. You know, I'm assuming that here shortly, that's all going to change as well. So I tried to plan for as normal as possible and they'll have to tell us, but there's a good chance our basketball courts won't even be open. So no, I won't be able to offer some of that stuff. That makes sense. It does change weekly. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Tina. And something cool, just thinking about other ways to sort of, I don't know, improv with some sports. So if you just look at the different all-star contests that um, are done through professional sports with baseball, basketball, um, football, oh my goodness, and hockey. Um, do just various skills competitions. Um, that way you're able to stagger participation and still have your staff tracking how people are performing in those um, different sports. Um, and that way you can award an overall champion if you are in person. 
um, to just keep people moving and active. Yeah. Has everybody jumped on the uh, esports bandwagon? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, done esports, done words with friends, going to be doing a second round of esports and words with friends over the summer. Um, so definitely uh, working with that and um, looking to, I'm sure um, when we resume in the fall or in person or um, at a distance, we'll continue with uh, esports as a program um, for the foreseeable future. Is anybody out there right now doing any intramural or, or any of your club sports active right now? Anybody? Slippery Rock is a no-go until we get back in the fall for a club sport, unless they're randomly doing it on their own that we don't know about. Um, and intramurals is kind of on hold. And we just got our two committees back together to talk about programming, just kind of going through one central point so we don't overwhelm the students virtually. And we send a newsletter out once a week to kind of let them know what's going on. Um, and that should start up pretty quickly again to see if we're going to do that. Okay. And just to answer uh, Michael Thomas's question, um, I would say, I mean, a lot's dependent on where you are in the country, what your county is. Because um, I know even within Pennsylvania, there are some counties that are in yellow, some that are in uh, red. Um, I'm currently in a county that's red, and we're going to be transitioning to yellow, but even in yellow, uh, gyms, fitness, and sports cannot open up. Um, I don't know what the different counties are, what the state of West Virginia is like with regulations, but I think um, con quote unquote contact sports um, are for sure out the window um, at this point. So we've spoke a little bit here about programs that we're offering for intramurals and most of us, according to the chat feature, do both intramurals and club sports. So let's take this same topic here um, as far as our club sports go. goes. Does anybody have any guidelines yet as to whether or not their club sport programs will be allowed to come back in the fall? At WVU, we haven't had anything official, but the expectation is that no one will be able to travel, including our clubs. So what that looks like for practice is something we're still figuring out. So this is Jean at Old Dominion University and what we um, are anticipating is going to happen is that the sports can come back but they will be do, doing more conditioning. Um, it'll be more individual, like the individual sports can do things, for example equestrian because it's just the person and the horse. Um, but any team sports um, you've even talked about swimming, that you really couldn't do that. Um, so I think it'll be individual sports. It would not be any travel. We've already been told in a meeting yesterday there will be no travel in the fall. Um, so a lot of it's going to be conditioning, maybe some video where you know, the clubs can look at video and do some um, you know, video. Yeah, some of our clubs will get together and they'll watch games and um, you know, they'll learn stuff. And, and that's what we're thinking is going to happen in, in the fall where we are. What, what about the rest of you? Anybody anybody foresee their club sports kind of falling apart if they're not allowed to do anything? I mean, are you going to struggle to keep the kids involved? Well, I don't have an answer to that, but I did have a question as of uh, I wanted to pose to the group as far as uh, intentions for recruiting for club sports. Uh, we have, you know, uh, sometimes an issue recruiting new members, and, and that's a, you know, we spend a, a a good portion of the first part of, of the fall uh, trying to recruit and usually into the spring semester to recruit. And by the time we recruit, it seems like we're going into the next school year. So what are some recruitment tactics, especially if they aren't able to travel uh, or maybe even participate as a club? Um, so as uh, for recreation and wellness falls under athletics at Swarthmore. Um, and so I'm lucky enough to be able to um, work with D3 um, varsity sport coaches. So what they're doing, um, and I think could be similarly used for club sports in the fall, is they're doing um, team session, like Zoom calls, um, to get people to meet whoever's on the current team as a returner, um, with the hopes that they will, it'll spark an interest, 
um, they'll become friends. And then whenever they do return to campus and um, activities can resume that they will end up joining the team. Um, and obviously it's a different, there's a different aspect to how they're doing it um, related to varsity athletics and recruiting the individual and hoping that they commit to the school. And they're doing this pre the individual um, committing or, or um, confirming with the institution, but a good, that's a good strategy for um, in the fall doing a virtual club sports activities fair. Um, you can have folks join and then put them in a different breakout rooms using Zoom or Blue Jeans or Microsoft Teams um, to like sort of just give an overview of club sports and then do various breakout rooms or do uh, different sessions throughout the week for um, each club sport team. Anybody else have any um, comments about club sports and our expectations or our fears of what might happen to them as far as programming? So one thing I worry about is with like our ice hockey club because the majority of their season happens in the fall semester. They only have a few games that happen in January, early February. If we're not allowed to do anything, um, you know, I haven't heard anything from the conference yet, ACHA or our local. I don't know if anybody else has heard anything on, are they still planning to go forward? And is it just going to be like, well, our club's just SOL because anybody in the state of Virginia can't do anything. So with that, um, at the last sport clubs roundtable that NERSA put on through the ideas in motion, um, they talked about this uh, national governing body outreach. Um, so earlier this week, they started reaching out to the clubs for professionals or the nurse of professionals who expressed an interest in um, reaching out to different national governing bodies. I was, um, I reached out to USA Ultimate um, with questions about if they've made decisions for the fall, can they share this information or um, sort of if they know when they're going to be uh, sharing this information, um, do they have guidelines, sports specific guidelines for practicing, um, what if somebody, a team has paid their membership fee and the fall season is canceled, will they get a refund? What sort of a policy with that? Um, if a school can't participate due to travel restrictions, are they penalized or can they use that, uh, like can they credit towards another semester? Um, what's each governing body's uh, policy with regard to eligibility? Will they get an additional year similar to what the NCAA did? Um, and then will that specific governing body um, have, do they have an interest in putting together um, a panel or a Zoom webinar with professional athletes in that specific sport so that club sport athletes can join and just connect and, and hear how it's not just hitting them on the college campus, how it's affecting um, others within the professional realm. And I think the um, results of that should be published through the NERSA Connect, um, I would say later this month or, or early July. I know that's it's a few weeks away, but um, got to uh, sort of give the organizations um, some time to respond. We're kind of in the same boat. Uh, our men's and women's rugby team are part of INSCRO um, and in their, the Allegheny Rugby Union. And we have no guidance from them yet either. I think everybody is waiting to see what is going to happen, you know, with these phase one two openings, phase two openings, whether we're going to get a second big huge, uh, you know, increase in the numbers, and then we're all going to be sent back home again. So we have no guidance yet. Uh, uh, women's volleyball, their national organization as well, um, has no guidance for them yet either. Uh, all of my clubs, we've encouraged them to give me tryout dates, to give me dates that they would like to, you know, set up tables on Main Street. And that, and even though we're planning on setting up tables, I've been told that that may go virtual now, that um, we, we won't actually have a physical table. There might just be virtual things going on. But regardless, I'm trying to stay positive with all of these teams and move forward as if they're going to have a season. You know, our cheerleaders at Fairmont State fall under us as a club sport. And there's a good chance that at the D2 level, they're trying to limit the number of people that are there that cheerleaders won't even be allowed to be there. So, you know, I didn't want to tell them that yet. We wanted, you know, we went ahead and set up dates for them to have their tryouts and do everything as if it's going to be normal. But as we all know, we don't know what the new normal is going to be yet. Anyone else with 
club sports, you know, concerns or issues out there? Nobody. Uh, so something I'm putting in the chat is, um, I'll, and I'll link the article as well, um, for Division Three in the NCAA, they just, uh, last week they played, they put out a statement that there's a 33% reduction in the minimum games required to play to be eligible for postseason competition or to be able to, like, say that you're supporting that NCAA sport. Um, so that is something that maybe, like, just to, to think about. Um, obviously, nothing has been fully set for the NCAA yet uh, for the fall. Um, I have heard rumblings that they might defer the um, sort of oversight or, or, I don't know, oversight of it to the actual conferences themselves. So um, the other, and just, yeah, I guess sort of putting the liability or putting the decision-making on the, the institutions and the conferences um, rather than uh, making it as a decision for across the country. So I just noticed that Dan put um, a thing in there about the increase with liability. And, and I know, so I was supposed to run a summer camp this summer. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we were going to have to add to um, the acknowledgement of risk was some, some language about COVID. And I'm wondering if you might have to add that in. We have an acknowledgement of risk consent to treat form that all of our sport club athletes have to fill out and, and sign. I'm wondering if, we're going to need to add something with COVID now that in addition to the risk, you're acknowledging that there's a risk based on participating in the sport, that now there could be a risk of, you know, because of the close contact that you might have with COVID. So I don't know if that's something anybody else has thought of, of adding that type of language into, I mean, you know, we can't call it a waiver. We have to call it an acknowledgement of risk form. It's definitely something I've thought of with our assumption of risk and release of liability waiver or, or release of liability form um, is checking with our um, general counsel to see if they want, uh, will be updating it to add a statement regarding infectious disease um, rather than specifically um, listing one type of infectious disease. Uh, so um, definitely, so that, I mean, that's what I'm going to be doing here at Swarthmore. It's um, something that we I had thought about as well, and I actually sent it to our university. I sent my program planned programming calendar to our university relations department and asked them, is there a statement that you all have that I need to put on here, you know, regarding the risk of, of coming and participate and possibly being around someone who may have unknown symptoms or something. I have not heard back from them, and I actually sent that a good three weeks ago. So again, I think all of our universities, all of our institutions, our legal councils, nobody really knows how to move forward with this. Um, and, I, and I think that since it's constantly changing, that they're, they're waiting. You know, it may be a week before I go back before I actually hear, oh yeah, please add this statement to it, because we don't know what that statement could look like. You know what it might look like now versus what it might look like a month from now. So. so we talked a little bit about programming that we're hoping to offer and things like that. Um, here's the good question. Do students really want, so if we can't offer the things that we, we want to and we have to go virtual, do students really want to engage in virtual recreation? How did you all do once we were all sent home in March uh, and having to move everything to virtual recreation as far as sport programming is, is concerned. How did you all do? How were your numbers? How did you change your programming? Um, and let's be honest, did your students just check out? I mean, all your efforts of trying, all your planning, and maybe one person participated. So uh, let's look at that uh, discussion here for a little bit. Tina, I think they checked out, in my opinion. That's, I mean, we tried our best to get them involved with esports and so forth, and people are throwing out these wonderful things. My intramural guy was getting back to me. He's like, I got eight people playing this. They're, they want normalcy. They want normalcy in their lives. It was getting toward the end of the school year. They don't interact with us too much in the summertime anyhow. So uh, it's, uh, I think 
there's something about the brick and mortar of a gym and everything that goes along with it, courts and so forth. And uh, I think that's what they're waiting for to happen. So um, that's just my personal experience. Has anyone had, did anyone have, if you've looked at your participation numbers, um, more additional unique participants from going virtual than you would have had from being in person? Because if you're getting more unique participants, you're getting new folks involved in intramural sports that haven't been before. So it could still be worth putting on those programs um, if we are virtual in order to get those folks who might not step onto the flag football field or might not go and play intramural basketball to get them interacting and building a community, even if it is through esports or virtual recreation or words with friends or something like that. That's what we're going with, Max, is even if we do go in person, we're still going to offer esports and some virtual programming because it was new participants. Um, but to go off what Dan said, to start off, because it was such a short amount of time, it started off strong. But then even our outreach throughout the whole university and our subcommittees found that Dan was absolutely right. Near the end, it just kind of went downhill and students were over it. They wanted the semester to end and they were kind of tired of being bothered. Yeah, the same uh, here at Marshall. We, we increased unique participants, but it was for our uh, Rocket League. That was uh, the only one with significant increase. And that was because generally one or two of the members of the three-person team plays intramurals, uh, but they recruited one or two members uh, that now have an IM Leagues account that did not before. So uh, we saw more increase in unique participants in the team esports, so Rocket League for us. I think the other issue was, you know, and our students are always on the computers, but when they, their classes then moved to online virtual, it was like everything was online. They, I had students come, I am tired of being on the computer. I thought I would never hear that out of students that they were tired of being on the computer. And now that I'm doing all these Zooms, I, I'm like, I'm tired of being on the computer. Yeah, Zoom fatigue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so they were like, I'm, I'm not interested in doing recreation, virtual recreation. I, I want off the computer. I want to go outside. I want to you know, go do something. So, you know, I, I I'm oh, sorry. No, you go, Tina. I, I had found the exact same thing that, you know, that Dan had said. When they were forced to, to go home and then have to do their classes online, they checked out. You know, I mean, I tried, I tried a virtual rock, paper, scissors tournament. Zero people signed up. I spent countless hours making this wonderful sport movie bracket. And on all my social media sites every day, you voted movie against movie. Three people. <laughs> You know, and then everyone said, oh, it's eSports. Everybody wants eSports. So I used IM Leagues and I created a couple eSport tournaments. One person signed up. That was it. So, I mean, I, tr I mean, and these are things that I do have on my burner that I'm going to continue in the fall, hoping that, well, okay, this is a new semester. Now everybody knows that we have to do virtual stuff. I'm going to try them again. So like some of you were saying, you got some new unique participants. I'm hoping to see that. I did not see it here in the spring. Um, and, you know, if that's all I'm allowed to do in the fall, then I'm, again, hoping that I'll see some, but mine checked out. And so thinking about how to get students involved who might have checked out in sort of a competitive framework, um, I know it sort of bridges the gap between competitive sports and fitness and wellness, but in April and to May, I did a, a five-week um, mileage challenge or mileage competitions to see who could rack up the most miles. I used a website called challengerunner.com, um, which is a very, in esports, people talk about cross platform games. It's a very cross uh, smart device or cross um, wearable um, platform. Um, so just setting it up, setting up the framework. Um, people just authorize their um, device and then creates just some general competition. You can then put out uh, communication tips, work with your fitness and wellness people um, to sort of combine and collaborate on a program um, to try and hit a larger group of folks. And um, that's sort of a question that I have is, what are some competitive virtual programs that we can f facilitate to encourage physical activity? And it doesn't have to be something related to a computer. It could be like, I talked about the, the mileage competition or uh, what Matt talked about um, with the, the mountain bike trail and whoever has the best time, something like that. What program?
recommended you use again, Mark? Uh, I will I will put the link to it in the chat box. Um, it's called Challenge Runner. How many of you, um, a lot of things that we could suggest of, there's that fine line, are they a fitness program or are they an intramural sports program? Um, because there were several things that, you know, we were, you know, with the help of NURSA and the round tables that I did back in March, great ideas about virtual 5Ks, you know, virtual fitness challenges and stuff. But then I uh, shared them with my fitness and wellness coordinator and he did them under his programming. So how many of you are doing fitness things as an intramural program? Tina, that's a good point. What we did was uh, we did a step challenge and we elected to put it on our IamLeagues.com. Mm -hmm. We were so bombarded on our Facebook page with all our fitness and wellness stuff. We thought we should have shifted some of this stuff over to intramurals, okay? Because, uh, you know, we were seeing like 80 or 70 different things on our fitness and wellness page for on our Facebook page, and there would be like three things on an intramural page. So we wanted to shift things over to try to get a new audience and like, the, you know, to keep people fresh and say, well, I, I can sift through all this stuff, okay? So that was a big reason why we did it was just to, just to get some things off of our fitness and wellness website, okay, that we were using on Facebook and put it on IM links just for some other people to see it. Okay. That's a great, a great uh, way to do it. I mean, you have as intramural and club sport professionals, we have a large group of students that we interact with throughout the entire year. And if we can send out this step challenge on IM leagues to all of our participants from the entire 2019-2020 uh, school year. And at, like, that might be somebody who doesn't check the fitness and wellness Instagram page or the, the like sees an email come from whoever your fitness and wellness coordinator is on campus. They just automatically delete it because they just want to do an email. So it, it hits a different group of the student body in a different way and it might just pique their interest because it does have that competitive, like they're like, oh, I am leagues. It's obviously gonna be something competitive. Anybody else's thoughts as far as intramurals is concerned? What about on club sport? Or Karen, you have something? No? Tina, just jumping in about club sports, I wanted to share um, two resource pages that um, I received from um, an individual from UC Irvine and um, an individual from uh, um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to sort of build um, club sport community and keep people involved through different challenges while they are at a distance. So I'm just going to put those resources in the um, chat. You can download them. Um, and use them and I'll also put the contact info of the individuals who I received them from um, so you can reach out if you have any questions. Okay. okay. You know, I was going to answer the question that Michael Thomas put about losing frequent team sport participants in the fall without your normal team sports. Um, our university, it seems like it's done a really good job of they're not single focused on intramurals. Are you bringing people to the table? It's more a student affairs collective group of are you outreaching and what are you working together on to outreach to as many students as possible? So even if we lose frequent team sport participants in the fall, if we can only do half virtual and half in person, we're hoping that in the spring, if we go full board and that everyone would come back since we're kind of working together on all of our collaborations for our programming. Okay. Well, with club sports, um, again, if we take that question, did, did your students really want to engage in anything virtually this past semester when they were kind of sent home? And what, if anything, were you able to do with them? So, so basically, all my teams were done. They didn't want workouts because they knew they weren't coming back, you know, in the spring. Um, so I really only got to work with my student leaders. And through the nurse around tables, I, I learned um, through the NFHSS, you, they had all those free courses. So it was a good opportunity for me to take my student leaders of my club teams and kind of force them to do the, the concussion test protocol, to do the social media protocol. Um, there was three or four really good ones 
that were, were free um, that I did require all of my student leaders to do. And that is something that I will carry over in the fall, well actually forever now, you know, so being forced to take them virtual, um, you know, they got to engage in those, but I tried to do bi-weekly student leader meetings with all of my club, you know, presidents and things. And again, they had checked out. They were like, do we really have to meet? What are you, what are you telling us? What do we want to know? That kind of stuff. So take that same question with club sports. What about the rest of you this, this past semester? Did they check out? Were you able to do stuff with them? And if so, what share so we can all take advantage of that? At WVU, through um, some of our virtual intramural sport programs, you know, we did a, a trick shot challenge and, a, and we tried uh, to do a, a virtual 5K as well. Um, but with the trick shot challenge, we actually, most of our participants were um, club sport members. So granted, they are, you know, are more involved clubs um, and such, but seeing their representation there, um, not only through the, the trick shot challenge, but the... Um, Steph, maybe you could help me, the, the soccer ball roll call where they kick the ball and then pass it to the person on the screen um, was sort of a challenge amongst um, a, a couple of different um, institutions, which was, was great to see. Um, but it really came from those clubs that we had seen more engagement from throughout the year. Um, so then uh, naturally over the summer, they're, they're looking for emails from us more about you know, different ways to get involved and, and things like that. Thank you. Anybody just posted, else? I just posted what looks like the link to various courses through NFHS. Yeah. Um, there's one for like PA announcing, ACL injury prevention, um, band safety, blocking and defense for um, football, just different things. A, a course for captains. So maybe asking your club sport leaders to participate in this captain's course. So Tina, that was a great um, suggestion. So with our sport clubs, I mean, everything was pretty much done, but we did move our um, new officers training from an in-person to an online. Then they had a test that they had to take. And then we were supposed to have our banquet on, um, so we used to have our banquet for years on the Spirit of Norfolk, which was a boat that would sail out until we had a young man who decided to jump off the boat. <laughs> and uh, the University said we couldn't do it anymore and our sport club executive board did a great job this year of going to The associate dean and getting permission for them to go back on the boat this year and then COVID took care of that so We transitioned our sport club banquet to a virtual banquet um, and just uh, our athletic trainer and Some of our executive board members put together a really nice video that we sent out So we were still able to recognize them at the end of the year and put that out. Um, hopefully we can get back on the boat next year. <laughs> I'm gonna get off the beaten path here for a little bit and think a little bit larger here and I apologize. Um, with the pandemic going on, declining enrollment obviously, now it's gonna probably happen for a lot longer. Has anybody given any thought about how we're gonna create more value for our campus recreation department over the long term to validate what we do, its value. I mean, you've got club sports. I know I have 250 uh, participants and our budget is zero. So I tell my boss this, he tells his boss this and it gets shuttered away. So think in a year or two or three years down the road, is anybody formulating any thoughts about creating value for our campus rec department, whether it's fitness and wellness, whether it's club sports, whether it's intramurals, whether it's esports. Has anybody shifted past the pandemic at this point in time and thinking like, we do a lot of good here. We connected a lot during this pandemic. We continue to connect. What's, what's the plan? So something that I started. Good question. No, oh, yeah. I mean, that's an awesome question. I think it's very, I mean, it's a pressing manner to like for the value of higher education, the value of recreation. Um, I know NERSA put out these graphics, these infographics um, a few weeks ago about 16 ways to tell your administration about the value of campus rec. But beyond that, um, before the pandemic, um, I was working with our institutional research because we have all of this information about who is participating and how often they're participating. But maybe, but I don't know, 
at least in my institution, we haven't done a comparison of users of recreation and wellness programs to non-users related to their happiness on campus or their connectedness or their um, academic performance or retention. Um, so just those are ways to try to show your value to the entire, to the administration, those higher ups that you're um, trying to prove the worth of. And try, if you're the director, you're trying to keep your staff around so that um, to keep putting on these programs. So you want to show that there is value in the programs that they are putting on. Um, so just thinking about working with institutional research on your campus, using those student ID numbers that you're collecting when you check in for intramurals or signing up on AM leagues or the, your club sports. So uh, maybe you want to see if participating in club sports has a correlation to academic performance or happiness on campus or retention. Um, so just working with them, they probably do these end of year student surveys or these um, like they'll probably survey the freshman class when they come in and then they'll survey them as their seniors leaving to just have to compare how like your institution has changed their life or has it had an impact on them. Um, so just um, a thought for you and feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat if you want to um, chat offline. You know, I think and it, we're not, NARSA has so much information that we can use, Dan, to kind of prove our worth. They've done the research for us. I mean, we all have contributed to those studies that NARSA has done. Um, and you can, I have used those in multiple reports showing how intramurals and club sports and campus recreation all contributes, you know, just saying that Maxis says, all contributes to uh, retention and graduation rates and stuff. So take advantage of those. Um, you know, when I know, you know, sometimes we get all so many emails, and you don't read them all, um, file them away because you can definitely go back and use those NURSA reports to prove to your administration how our programs keep kids here. I mean, I have literally have kids that have taken an extra semester because they wanted to play intramural basketball. They've taken a three hour or six hour, you know, credits just so they could come back and still play with their friends, you know. So use, use those numbers and those uh, surveys and research things that NURSA has put out there to show your administration how important we are to retention um, and graduation rates. Uh, that will help. Anybody else? Well, we have a little bit of time left. The last question, um, the last topic that I wanted to get out there real quick, we've touched on it a little bit, but now specifically, what are some competitive virtual programs that we can all facilitate to encourage physical activity? So we've talked about the trick shot contest. Uh, that seemed to be very, very popular. Virtual rock, paper, scissors tournaments. Obviously, we have our, all of our esports that we can do, and we can make those in IM leagues as just two-week tournaments, or we can make them semester leagues. So we have all of those. Um, I think, Max, you mentioned the virtual, like, words with friends and, and uh, some other things. So in case, in case we do not get to see our physical courts and fields this coming fall, what are we all going to do? What else is out there? Anybody? Wow, are we all gonna have jobs in the fall? <laughs> I don't know if I can sit in front of this computer for eight hours again come fall. That was the that was the hardest two months of my job, and like I said, I've I've been there 26 years. So, um, virtual programming is tough in our world for campus recreation, and I think that for both intramurals and club sports, our fitness and wellness coordinators are gonna we're gonna become very close with them because a lot of our programming may end up you know not just being some competitive sport things but also some competitive fitness things that we could do some things that you all mentioned the step challenges the virtual 5ks sit-up challenges i mean you could do a virtual plank challenge you know everybody has to be online at the same time as you fall you're you know you're out type of thing 
So a lot of our, our competitive programmings may look like fitness programs come fall. Who knows? But is any, any good things that any of you have thought about other than what I've mentioned? I can't hear you, Dan. Dan, you're muted. <laughs> we only have one court at this point in time, a multi-purpose court. And one thing we did think about is to add value to what we do is if, if any of our academic people need to use half the court for a class or whatever, we get, we're gonna give it to them. So it might be a little bit noisy, but at least it adds value to what we do with the court, okay? So if we're providing that space for a dean or a chair, they're gonna be ecstatic about that. The president will be ecstatic about that. So that's something that we've thought about. We obviously, we have the divider, so that is a possibility. Anyone else out there? I was on a call, um, I think it was last week, and the I think director at UVA was saying that their gyms will probably turn into classrooms, that they will be putting dividers down and start using their gymnasiums as classrooms. Um, when I was talking with our director, you know, I was thinking that our staff would be brought back probably sometime in the fall, but he was saying, you know, it's probably just going to be facility people coming in, that there's probably not going to be any programming happening in the fall semester. It might be program people coming in to help run the facility, but he does not really see all of our staff coming back until January. So I was, I just did not expect that. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually have to jump on, I, I got to get ready for another, another Zoom. So I'll see you guys later. Bye, Gene. Thank you. Tina and I do want to um, thank everybody for joining today. Um, we do want to be conscious of everybody's time, give you all a few minutes in case you do have a two o'clock meeting, um, but definitely continue the conversation through Nurse Connect. Thanks to um, the West Virginia schools for putting this all together and welcoming in uh, neighboring states and fellow colleagues um, to participate. I know I've um, enjoyed this uh, intimate chat today and thanks to uh, Tina for uh, co-facilitating with me. My sentiments as well. Right. Any last words anybody wants to get in? Um, one thing I would just like to say, and it might be, I mean, I'm from Alabama, so far ways away, but one thing that I know our neighbors in Mississippi have found helpful that I think we would find helpful with our programming is taking advantage of cross-state rivalries and kind of coordinating, like, right last Alabama-Auburn, um, Mississippi did the best in Mississippi challenge. I know that might be tough for some of us that are at smaller universities. Um, it might not be something that you have, but just kind of a little thought to kind of be collaborative beyond just our campus. Great idea, great idea, Michael. All right, so the, it was recorded, so they will get these posted. So the chat, Max put several links in the chat for you all. Um, so if you need those, uh, you know, you'll have access to them. Have a good rest of the, the conference, everybody. Hope to see you in some of the other sessions uh, tomorrow or later this afternoon. Thank you. Be well. Thank you.